Hi, my name is Molly and I am with the staff at Scrum Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us for the webinar, Stop Facilitating the World's Most Boring Meetings. This is the third webinar in our Approaching Agility webinars for Aspiring Changemaker series, which aims to introduce agile topics and techniques to anybody who is curious about agile and scrum. In today's webinar, we're going to be exploring what most meetings look like in today's world of work and common mistakes that we can all learn to avoid as the meeting facilitators and even as meeting participants and hosts. Hopefully, you're going to walk away today with a toolbox of valuable techniques that can be used right away as a meeting facilitator to improve your meetings. So just a few things before we get started. All of the webinar participants will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, either for Vibu or a member of staff, please drop those questions into the chat or the Q&A, and we'll be monitoring those throughout the webinar. Um, please, if you have questions specifically for Vibu, please put them in the Q&A box. We will be doing a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Um, this webinar will be recorded and we will be sending the recording out to all of y'all afterwards as well, as well as posting it on our resource library. So don't worry, you'll have access to the webinar recording, the webinar slides, and some additional content after this. And so without further ado, I am really excited to introduce Babu Srinivasan and take it away, Babu. Awesome, folks. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Welcome. Um, and let's kind of talk about an interesting topic, right? Um, this is something that most of us can relate to. So today I picked a topic called, um, what if we, imagine if we facilitated the most boring meeting ever, how would that look like, right? So what would happen and, and how we can stop facilitating such meetings, right? Because one of the things that's happened a lot these days is um, all of us can relate to going to multiple meetings, Almost all of us have back-to-back -back meetings these days. Sometimes my calendar has about five meetings in the same time, and you're trying to figure out which one should I go to. And then you end up in some meeting and you figure out like, oh my God, that is the worst meeting ever. And how do I get out of this meeting? But sometimes we stay there because of social pressure, uh, because leaving may be seen as a negative thing. And sometimes we just, you know, kind of leave because we just can't take it, right? So, so the goal of today's session is to think about how do we do well as facilitators and give you some actual techniques, tips that you can take away um, and um, uh, that you can use right away in your work um, immediately, right? So um, again, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Vibhu. Uh, I have been an Agile practitioner since two, 1998. In fact, that's the only thing I know. Uh, I uh, have been in the Agile world uh, mostly uh, from starting from extreme programming, Scrum, Kanban, um, come from a technology side. But today, um, and I'm also a Scrum Alliance certified Scrum trainer. I'm super passionate about teaching. So I've been teaching uh, Scrum and Agile for the Scrum Alliance for the last 12 years. I've done around five, 600 workshops over the time. Um, I'm also a um, founder of a company called Agilis, where we teach a lot of this stuff. And, um, and, uh, and I work at uh, Accenture in the cloud space. So I am a kind of a cloud solution architect. So a lot of the things uh, you see here is, um, is something that I use every day. So hopefully you find meaning in what you see today. Um, this is my family, it's an agile family. So you meet my wife who's a pharmacist, my son and daughter. And so we do agile at home. That's why I show it, my pets, uh, my um, Oreo and Zuri. It's a little bit about me, right? So. Um, what else, right? So I think um, for that introduction, uh, I want to maybe a little bit around what we do. Um, so there's a lot of beliefs around Agile, right? We call them orthodoxies. Um, things that we think should work only in a certain way and our beliefs stop us from doing things in a certain way. So our goal of Agile is, is to kind of unlock and unpack those orthodoxies in people so that we can actually create teams that are you know, high potential teams, right? So that's a bit of what we do in uh, the Agile world. Okay, so um, let's come back to the topic of meetings. Um, and when when we think about meetings, um, the I started by saying, you know, a bad meeting, right? So top two reasons for bad meetings is the first one is an ineffective, uh, somebody, a facilitator who's not really prepared. So they show up and they are not ready to facilitate the session. And, and that's like one of the top two reasons why meetings are really bad from, you know, uh, from 
from really bad to bad, right? And the second one is having a very unclear purpose and unclear uh, outcome. So people start the meeting and end up with another meeting. So you're just stuck there, right? So those are kind of the top two things. But gatherings have been a big part of human culture, right? So for so many years, uh, you may have seen uh, back in the day even, people get together and they talk about, you know, um, kind of the gathering, let's get together and talk because humans like to work together. So that concept of working together, you know, when we started in like working, I mean, we now call that as a meeting, but I see meeting as a gathering space. Now, why do we gather? You know, sometimes we gather to reach consensus, you know, for whatever reason we want to meet as a team um, and we want to, um, you know, share ideas. Sometimes we gather because we want to share some information back, right? So, um, and we want to give something back to a lot of people. Sometimes we may do something on, we need some clarity or guidance on something. So maybe it's a design that I've prepared and I want to call a bunch of people and ask them, how is this design and get some more ideas into that. Or it's just sometimes an informal get together. So lately, uh, especially in the post COVID era, there's a lot of meetings about mindfulness and just meeting your team. Because back in the day, we used to all work in offices. So we used to see each other a lot. Um, but nowadays with us working from home, um, it's a lot more important that we actually meet our team and, and our leaders want to know what our team is doing. So gatherings or meetings have taken a whole new meaning, right? So my goal of this session is to help uh, think through how can we get better as facilitators and improve the life of so many people um, because you know, we can make, you know, everybody's life more joyful and fun if the facilitator does a good job at preparing for meetings. So, so that's the context of the today's session is from a facilitator's angle. So we, we do a good job in running these meetings. Okay. Um, so when we think of gatherings, you know, and you can probably relate to these kind of meetings, right? So on one side, you have these one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, so maybe you have uh, a meeting with the manager, maybe you're meeting your team member, maybe there's a new joinee who has come into your company and you want to talk to them about how the norms of the company are. So one-on-one -on -one meetings are, you know, kind of nice because you can connect with people, um, you know, whether on Teams or Zoom or whatever, where you can put your video on, you're a lot more uh, direct because there's only two people in the conversation, you know. Now, second kind of meeting is a smaller group of people. Um, this is something you can relate to, right? When you have a group of people, and let's say you know those group of people. So for example, family members, close friends, um, you may notice that there's a certain amount of like free behavior in those calls. People are a lot less reserved and you're kind of open to conversation. We don't mind putting the video on because we know these people, right? Um, so it's a lot more easier to work with those kind of meetings. Uh, but smaller groups sometimes also has like people that we don't know, right? So even it could be one person that we don't know, or it's a client call and you, you know that you're going to a call with a customer there, and maybe there are six people, but one among them is a customer. So all of a sudden, the behavior that comes, the group behavior that we do as humans tends to be a lot more formal, and, and, and we need to think about how to manage that session um, and how do you engage these people as we go along. So that's a set of kind of the smaller group, but the people that we kind of want, some of, some of them we don't know, right? Then you have these large groups and anything more than an eight people meeting, I consider it as a mob, right? Um, generally, you know, three, uh, eight plus is a big group. It's tough to manage these things. Uh, but it's mostly informational only, or like today, right? We have many people in the call, but it's mostly for learning purposes or sharing ideas purposes. Um, so large group meetings. So as a facilitator, think about when you start thinking about meetings and gatherings, you may want to think about what, which one are you doing? Because depending on the type of meeting that you're facilitating, uh, the way you may engage with the people will completely differ uh, in depending on the kind of gathering that you're going to facilitate. Okay. Um, and then you have kind of different types of meeting, right? So we have like this one-time meeting. So for example, like today I'm presenting, although it's a repetitive webinar, I am presenting today once, you know, and then um, so it's a one-time meeting, you know, or, or maybe it's a, a meeting with uh, somebody, it's one-time meeting. And then you have these recurring meetings. So in most scrum teams, they'll do something called as a daily scrum. Um, just by name, it happens every day. So you gather around something and you talk about. So those are kind of generally the two types of meetings, one time and recurring. 
and and you probably are going to be less um, you know worried recurring meetings you know these people and you're going to show up so it's going to be easier to facilitate these things but sometimes these one time meetings like a business discussion you're trying to win a deal you got to be a lot more prepared for these one time meetings because it is your one shot to get this thing done well so you you know think about as a facilitator how you want to prepare for these things okay um see the other thing i want to point out is um there's a study about the productive hours in the us um before covid so this is the actual number of hours that we are really productive at work and uh, take a second and think about in your mind what this number could be um it's 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 like some if, if, so if you think about let's say 7 8 hours of productive work that's not true um it's like less than 5 it's actually 2.4 hours is the actual number of productive hours for a typical us based company in the it industry based on a couple of studies before covid so that doesn't mean we don't work but we have a lot of meetings we need to go to lunch we got to have the you know water cooler talk um, and so we have a lot of these other things going on and then there are distractions right so multiple projects we are working on so that is before covid two to one half hours of collaboration time the actual productive time hands on the keyboard time and now imagine what has happened after covid right so i'm only guessing that that number of hours has come down and i can i don't know if you feel like that but many a times people feel like when am i going to do the work because my day just goes by so fast um so you end up spending a lot of personal time in the evenings eating into all of that your own time um so it kind of be important that you be think about how to give this make this better and what what can we do as facilitators so that we actually create space for people to do well and that's your time and you're done with them so um i'm going to go into um kind of um how much you can personalize right so when you have small meetings so on something on on this side um you can be a lot more personalized uh, because um this is people we know or even if it's a small group but people we know uh, but as like large something like a small group yeah you can still personalize these meetings and make sure it's uh, taking care of individual needs but for larger groups of eight or more people uh, you got to generally follow like a certain pattern uh, maybe you're going to think about how to break them into groups maybe you're going to do team rooms so you're going to replicate the small group as much as possible think of scaling these small groups um in order if you need personalization the only way to do that is to break into small breakout rooms and do activities with them things like that so so as you plan your next meeting facilitation think about how much personalization do you need for getting the goals of this meeting done and then accordingly you got to design the experience which we're going to go into in a few minutes okay um so when you think of a meeting there's a couple of different roles um so most of these roles we are all pop probably familiar with the first role is somebody who is the host of the meeting a stakeholder right um so I, if i were to give an example let's pick an example um so we have a company there is a chief architect and the chief architect wants to um he's they have created some design and they want to bring a couple of these leads in order to get some input about their design so that's typically the host or the person who wants something done so that's kind of one role when you think about a meeting and that could be a single person sometimes it that could be a group of people as well so the host could be maybe three people who want to meet a bunch of people right so that's the one group on the other side you have this meeting is about the facilitator which is often the one person a facilitator is someone who is there to help other people succeed um they do not necessarily have a specific opinion one way or another um and they are experienced in running these events and meetings and make sure other people are doing a good job at whatever they do right so that's the facilitator role um so generally the recommendation is when you wear the facilitation hat or you now you know you're the facilitator the the um the suggestion is to think that your opinions now doesn't really matter because in this meeting you are simply facilitating so even though you may not agree with whatever is being spoken there it's really not about you it's about the host and the topics of the stakeholders and the participants so third group down here is is the people who are visiting right people who are coming to your session or co coming to the session that you are facilitating um the hosts are there and these are the people who often get stuck right so when people join they often many times these days especially participants come to these meetings because there are so many of them they just 
it's just another one for the day. So you really need to think about how do you want to make sure that these participants actually get value from this meeting and it, and they don't feel like, you know, something like it could have been an email situation, right? So many times um, you may go to a meeting and think like, oh, that, that could have been done in an email or why not just chat about it, you know? So, um, so you want to make sure that the participants are something that we think about. So, um, so I'm going to go a little bit into how those things do, uh, like how we plan about each of these people and how do you, um, how do you go about it. So we spoke about three roles, facilitator, participant, and the host. Uh, but there is a, a book called Collaboration Explained, and it's by Gene Tabaka. It's one of my most favorite books. And in that book, um, Gene explains a topic uh, when I was to work with her called, this is the other role, it's called as an observer. Um, so uh, just like a participant in meetings, we want to possibly also want to think about the observers. And, and the difference between a participant and observers are participants can, as the name says, participate, you know, they can talk, whereas observers generally remain silent. So this could be, for example, in this meeting, maybe the architect has invited some other architect in training, or maybe there's a, a VP or a, somebody in the company, a strong leader who wants to know, but is not interested in to give opinions, but they want to be there. So as a facilitator, you want to think about these different roles and be clear about who's the host, who are the hosts, who are the participants, and the third one is who are the observers that we would like to um, we would like to you know uh, be part of this event or meeting, right? So so with that introduction, let's go into um, a little bit into um, how does a meeting look like? Okay? Um, so generally, when we think about a meeting, what are some things um, and how do they look like? Um, so uh, when you think of a meeting, it's a container, right? So here is a container that we, we need to collaborate with. And so we want to gather a bunch of people into this container so that the facilitator can kind of facilitate collaboration so that their most creative potential is unleashed, right? So think of a meeting as that container. Uh, and when you think of a container uh, like that, the, the life cycle of a meeting, there are things that can happen before uh, sorry, I'll go back to this slide. So there are things that can happen before. There are things that can happen during the meeting. And then there are things that happen after the meeting, right? So, so we want to think about all of these three experiences. And this concept was kind of introduced by um, uh, the Agile Coaching Institute, which kind of brought about this Agile facilitation and how it looks like. So what we're going to look at today is a little bit of what do I, as a facilitator, do before a meeting starts? How do I manage with that? What do I do during the meeting? What are some different kinds of things that can happen during the meeting? And then what can happen after the meeting and how do we deal with that? So those are the three things we're gonna look at um, in, for the next few minutes. So, um, so this is kind of the overall flow, right? So our job as a facilitator is to design and create an experience for everyone to collaborate safely, right? We want to create a safe space where people come in and feel like their views are heard of. Um, so if you have been on meetings many times, um, many people remain silent. Okay? Now, silence is a very powerful form of, um, just like talking, silence is a very powerful form of communication. But sometimes we are silent because we're listening. Sometimes we are silent because we feel that our opinions don't matter. You know, um, sometimes we are silent because you, you know, because we just like you know are indifferent about this, right? So we've been here so long that we are like, I don't know, I just don't, I just, I'm a prisoner. I don't need to be here. They just invited me, therefore you're silent. So the safety factor is really important when you set up meetings. Um, and uh, if you have a meeting where somebody feels unsafe uh, or or there is something that's said about what's happening, whether it is verbal or non-verbal cues that can happen, then, then that is no more a safe space. So the number one thing um, a facilitator thinks about is, am I creating that safe space for everyone in the meeting to collaborate safely, right? And in general, before, during, after, right? So before, we want to think about two things. Uh, we want to start by saying, do does the host uh, understand the problem statement? Um, and do they, can they tell me what outcomes they want to see when this meeting is over? Okay, so we're going to get into a little bit details of that in a minute. So that's kind of what you do before, you know, before uh, the event starts. So um, uh, now after the event starts, 
um, you may be the main role of a facilitator is to facilitate collaboration um, and 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 manage all the dysfunctions that happen. You know, people may leave the meeting, somebody may switch off the video, um, someone may come late into meeting. So there's a lot of these dysfunctions happen. So you're facilitating collaboration, you're also managing all the dysfunctions and you're making sure that things, technology is a big deal today. So when you expect something is gonna happen, some, something else happens. So you're kind of doing management of all of that. And after the meeting, you follow up really quick with action items and say, um, um, here is what happened in this meeting and here are some couple of action items that we came up with. And then it's a great practice to do a retrospective with the stakeholders right away and say, how did this, how, with all of these people who you just spent an hour or two with these people, so what do we need to do? How, how did I do as a facilitator? Did this meeting go well? So you always close with a retrospective. So think of these as like the before state, the during state, and the after state of some of the key things a facilitator needs to think about when they are planning a meeting. So let's jump a little bit into the before part here. Uh, so what do we do in the before part? So problem statement. Um, so when you think of a problem statement, um, if you cannot describe it, so the, this is the host and the uh, facilitator, let's say they set up a meeting and they talk about can you help me describe what is the problem, problem you're trying to solve? And, and a good way to write a problem statement, um, as explained, uh, there's a format called how might we. So how might we comes from the design thinking experience um, and it, it is popularized by the Stanford Design School. So how might we um, brings kind of empathy into play and, and there are lots of, you can read up later on the Stanford D School on how might we and why it's a good technique to write problem statements. So, uh, so but the goal is, you spend um, a couple of hours sometimes with the stakeholders or the host to come up with the problem statement when designing, a, let's say, a one, one and a half hour session with a bunch of people. Um, so here is an example of uh, how might we statement. Uh, how might we create a new and differentiated experience for our basketball fans of our team so that they can interact with each other during the game on in the on game day real time, right? So, so you, you may work with the stakeholders iterate on some statement like this a couple of times, and then you probably want to get an agreement on, is this the right problem statement or right uh, problem we want to solve? Um, is this the right purpose for this meeting, right? So, so that's step number one. So assume that the, you and the uh, host agreed on that looks good and let's move to step two. And all of this is happening, remember, before the meeting. Now step two is, okay, I got we got the problem statement, but, I used to, uh, like one of my colleagues, uh, Mona, so she has kind of, when, whenever I worked with her, she would often say something like, what does success look like at the end of the meeting? And I, I really would like that statement because it makes people think about, um, think about how, what does success look like? And, and, and it, it goes back and forth. One of them will say A, one of them will say B. You write down all those ideas and then you come up with two or three things that if we do these three things, success is achieved. Right. So in this case, for example, the, the person says, we have many new ideas. You know, if we generate a lot of ideas so that we can come up with what makes a differentiated experience for fans, that's success for me. Right. And then someone else says, well, not just ideas, but I also want to make sure that those ideas are prioritized in some way. Right. So, so we want to talk about those two things. And so when you do something like this, you don't want to end up with like 20 different outcomes because then nothing is going to get done in that meeting. You want to focus on not more than three to four outcomes for a, a typical meeting of, let's say, one hour or whatever, right, 45 minute meeting. Um, and, and so that's the two parts, the first and second, the problem statement and the outcome. Generally, when I run these sessions for um, uh, teams or customers, this part itself often takes a lot of time. This may take a couple of meetings. This may itself take people disagreeing, agreeing on that. But once you get this part right, the rest of the part is execution. Now, this is where people do uh, mistakes. In most of the meetings, they, they don't agree on one and two, and yet they go and do the meeting. And now people show up and you have no idea why this meeting is going or not going. So my recommendation is kind of have like a go, no go check. So if you cannot define the problem statement, or the, the purpose. And if you cannot agree on a few outcomes for the meeting, then stop the meeting. Don't even invite those people and you know make them suffer there. So what we wanna do is go to the next step. So the next step would be something like send an invite. Okay, send an invite um, to people and say, 
why do you why do we want you here right maybe it's an exciting invite that goes along so i'll give you an example of that so a couple of years ago um, i was doing some work at an insurance company and the um, the the group folks in the company um, kind of the release date skipped by 6 months so the ceo of the company got really concerned and he wanted to meet all of those 120 people on a certain day because he wanted uh, he wanted this release done because they had a lot of legal ramifications of not making this release. So the way we planned that meeting was we sent an invite uh, from the CEO. It was a video message that went to all the employees, inviting them for a, a session um, you know, in their main office at like 11 a.m. that day. And we said, it's 11 to 4. We really want your opinions because we, we have to make this release, guys. So I'm seeking your help. So please come over, right? So, so it was more of a video that went out to all these 120 or so participants. And then on the day people came in, they didn't expect it. It was, it was feeling like there's some kind of a party going on. So we had balloons outside. We had like a band playing music outside, you know. When they walked in, we had some drinks set up, like, you know, a non-alcoholic drink set up for them, right? So when they came in, they all sat in a table. So the whole day felt like a celebration, right? And so they really enjoyed that they actually got to do something fun, have some lunch. But then the CEO and the and the team worked together and then, then he left. But then by the end of the day, they actually figured out a way to make the release, right? So if we bring people with a purpose, um, with the third thing is some kind of an inviting message that goes from whoever is the main host. So people feel they're wanted. You know, many times we, we have people in these meetings who feel they're just prisoners there. They're just there because they've been called. So you want to make sure that you send some kind of a, um, you know, some kind of a message that says, why do you need these people there, right? So, so assuming we do these three things, then um, maybe an invite goes along and people show up and all of that happens. Let's go further uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what happens during the meeting, right? Number one mistake I see for meetings today, and I highly recommend considering this, is nowadays people are doing back-to-back -back meetings. So you may be going from one to two, two to three, and sometimes one to 145. So there's so many meetings happening. So when you plan a meeting, think about blocking their time for one hour, but ending the meeting 15 minutes before, right? So that's the first thing to think about is like, how do I stop the meeting before it starts? And the second thing is, as a facilitator, you need to be there before time. So even though, and give yourself some space. So maybe you have 15 minutes of free time before the your next call starts. Because if, you, if you're not ready yourself, that's the number one reason um, that meetings don't go well is the opening then becomes really bad, right? So, so in that book, Collaboration Explained, um, Jean Tabaka, she kind of explains the, what, what do you need to do um, in these meetings? So this is a kind of a set of rules that we often talk about. So generally, if you think about, um, meetings, you could have a backlog like this on the wall. It's very nice for people to see, oh, these are the six steps. Um, these are the six steps we're gonna do. So it's kind of helpful to see what we're gonna do. So we're gonna start with the welcome uh, and, and then maybe we go into some ground rules. Um, ground rules are really helpful because uh, we're gonna give an example in the next one, what a ground rule is. Then maybe you'll have something called as a parking lot. I'm gonna give an example of that. Um, you may have set up some action item. How do, how do we capture action items? Maybe there's a board that you have set up, a virtual board so that people can add action items. And you clearly have printed the problem statement and outcome on a big virtual sticky note on a tool. So when people show up, you start the opening uh, by doing some of these activities. And I really like to move these sticky notes one at a time uh, so that people can see what's left to do because the most frustrating thing about a meeting is not knowing when it's going to end. You're like, oh, you're hoping that the time goes by, but by moving things on the wall like this visually, um, the people get more, something it achieves every two minutes, three minutes, and they really feel happy about it. So opening is probably, if you think of a one hour meeting, opening is probably not more than five minutes or so um, where um, uh, you kind of open with it and, and you close on the other side with something called clearing the parking lot. So and I'll tell you a minute what it is. You'll process the action items. Um, the, then after that, you're gonna do a retro on the meeting if you have the time, I always appreciate, uh, and then do appreciations, thanking people you know, who made a difference and then in close. And you can add more things here, but generally, you know, at least these items are just a framework for any meeting. Now, what goes in between the meeting is what then changes because you generally have an opening and a closing, and then you have something that's in between, right? That changes a lot. So let's see a little bit of 
an example of what I mean by these artifacts, ground rules and parking lot and those kind of things. So here is kind of a visual wall from a, another team, another board I had uh, last week for something, right? So it may look like that, right? So problem statement, it's on the wall. The outcomes are on the wall. When I say wall, I mean a virtual wall, right? Something that's, um, that's visible, uh, a tool, a virtual whiteboard. Uh, and then the working agreement is really, it comes from agile teams, but I think um, the concept of a working agreement or a, or a ground rule comes from agile teams, but I highly encourage it for any kind of meeting. So opening up with, um, for example, in this case, it says we will have one conversation only. Uh, hey guys, make sure that there are no other devices. Um, take care of yourself uh, and we'll start and end in time. And then after you read the working agreement, um, you're gonna give others all chance to add to it. Um, saying what else is missing? Do you think anything else has to be added to this? Um, and then people will do a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So you can use the Zoom feature of a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a Teams feature or literally people doing thumbs up like that. Now, the reason for you to do a thumbs up like that is if they don't agree, they could also do a thumbs down, you know? And, and then it gives you a chance to listen to why they are not agreeing to something. Uh, at the same time, if they do a behavior in the meeting that let's say they put on their phone or they are now uh, talking a lot because they violated the one conversation rule, you can then call them out and they're not gonna feel bad you call them out because you had told in the beginning of the meeting that you're gonna do so, right? So working agreements are a really uh, important aspect of, um, of uh, most meetings. I highly encourage you to try that in every meeting. And then you have some kind of a wall, which is empty in the beginning, uh, action items. It will say what, who, and by when. And then people are just talking and they can put these sticky notes on their own. You don't have to write and scribe for them. But essentially at the end of the meeting, when you close the action items, you're gonna come and ask like, who is gonna do this review design? Oh, Mark, you're gonna do that. Awesome, you know, uh, look, at, uh, look, look at some other option. Who's gonna do that, Mike? And, and then by when? So generally you capture these action items in the closing. And then the last thing I wanted to show was this concept of a parking lot. So a parking lot is for people who uh, we often call them tangent toms. So we have all these people in meetings and what they do is every time you have to say something, they have a completely separate topic that they'll bring in. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is not supposed to be that meeting. You're going off topic here. But then when people go off topic, oftentimes we don't know how to stop them. And therefore, especially if it's a person of power, somebody who's a leader, you know, director, whatever, right, senior person in the company, you just will not even stop them. So all of a sudden the meeting has taken a whole new agenda that you didn't expect it to do, right? So a parking lot is something you create up literally like a space like this and say our parking lot, and then you will teach them a technique called as a yellow card. So a yellow card in soccer, is basically you're saying, you know, that's a, that's a kind of a warning, right? Don't do that. So you could just have a yellow card sign. And every time somebody does something, maybe you yellow card them. They have one more minute for closing the conversation. And if they finish, you know, and it's still going on, you can just put the topic on the parking lot and move on. This way you're keeping the focus on the meeting and not just, you know, going on and on. So, um, so think about these basics, the problem statement outcomes, a working agreement, action items, and a parking lot as with, with the yellow card technique, talk to everybody in the meeting. So they know how to, so this will kick off your meeting and you kind of achieve a lot of this in the first few minutes, and then you go into the meeting itself. Okay, so um, moving on here. Um, so, so a big part of this now is that now that you have thinking about meetings, a big part of a meeting is designing the experience. Uh, because if we, give people who come to our meetings an amazing experience, they are gonna go back and talk about how cool this meeting was. Um, otherwise they're gonna go back and talk about how bad this facilitator was. And, and the, it, this person was like the worst facilitator, they probably did this and did that. So you, you wanna be in the other side. So a lot of the times our goal is to create an unbelievable experience for people like the, the party thing I spoke about at that insurance company, right? Something that they don't expect to happen. So. How can we do that? How can we design some experiences, right? Um, so I want to introduce this concept of um, different modes of thinking. So one of the ways you design experiences, these are the things you will do in between. So this is what you'll do in this session, right? In between, you're going to be doing a bunch of experiences or activities with the participants. And to design the activities, you want to think about kind of we have kind of two sides of thinking you know um, so out of the box we use both of them the one is for imagination one is for logic uh, and one is for kind of one 
can be used for brainstorming. And the other one is kind of linear thinking where you want to solve a problem, right? You want to get to something. So you want sometimes in meetings, it, it feels like you'll start with a divergent activity. You may do a couple of one more convergent activity. Then you may do some divergent activity, right? But as you get better and better, you're going to get lots of ideas of how do you mix and match these divergent and convergent thinking that we all have so that we can get something done in the meeting. Um, so uh, for example, right? Um, let's say we are a family and we are going on a long hike this weekend. And generally after a long hike, the question comes, where do you want to eat lunch? You know, so it's at least in my family, it's a big problem. Where do you, you want to eat lunch? And everybody has got five opinions. So you want to make sure that before you go on the hike itself, we kind of do a little bit of uh, divergent convergent thinking here. So we have picked a space. So how do we do that is you could use a technique. In this case, it comes from the design thinking school. It's called the crazy eight. Um, so crazy eight is coming up eight awesome ideas, eight crazy ideas about where could we do lunch. For example, uh, we could do Mexican, you know, Italian, uh, maybe we can just cook at home. We could carry Subway, right? So people will come up with all these ideas and you can't do any more. Each person can do maximum of eight, but you don't want to go more than eight and you'll do this in a very short, like a three minute time box. And so it's quick, you know, uh, it's called crazy eight and you do that and you may end up with something like this, right? So, uh, so here is kind of a divergent brainstorming happen. And maybe in this case, they only came up with six ideas or five ideas that like we couldn't come up with eight ideas. So the team says, Hey, we could, the family says, Hey, we could either eat Indian, Italian, Mexican, pizza, Chinese. They imagine there's one more call like, uh, I don't know, eat at home, right? So we take that. We take that and then we say, well, now what do we do with this information is we go and we uh, prioritize it, right? We kind of need to know who wants to do which one more. So generally there is a tech. So this is a technique called uh, dot voting. Sorry, I don't know why it's moving like this dot voting. So um, silent vote is what we call it. So you take the number of options. So here you have four or op five options. Uh, uh, and this, you just take a square root of the number of options. And then let's say you give each person two votes, then everybody in the family votes. And once you vote, you can, you can either vote on the same topic or you can vote on multiple topics. You can abstain from voting, uh, but you can't do, let's say any more than two. And then you see from this pattern that the, this family overall prefers either Italian or Mexican for this weekend's uh, you know, lunch after the hike. But now the, the discussion comes, well, let's sort it out because these are good, but I want to say expensive, affordable, uh, more votes, less votes. That's my prioritization, prioritization matrix. Uh, and then when you do like that, well, expensive. So Italian, maybe the restaurant near our house is expensive. So it's got more votes, but it's expensive. Indian near our house is like less votes, but it's kind of expensive. But the most affordable one for us is this, this is the end of the month. So we're kind of running short on cash. So let's do affordable. And then this Mexican restaurant near our house is, you know, really affordable. And so we'll do more votes and affordable. This kind of, and you can change these parameters based on whatever that is the intent that you're trying to do. In my case, I picked affordable, expensive. You may pick like high value, no, high, low value, high cost, low cost, um, various things you can do for the prioritization matrix, right? So what we showed is a way to get a bunch of ideas using crazy eight, ID eight. And then from there, you're gonna do like some kind of a dot voting. Then you go from there and you build like a, a prioritization matrix. So you can, um, you can get the, um, it's kind of an option to move on. So you can do something. Otherwise we're stuck and somebody in the family will say, we'll do pizza and they are stuck eating pizza, although you didn't want to do it, okay? So that's the convergent divergent idea and how do you engage with that? So what else can we do, right? Creative ideas for meetings. And I want to present a few short ones. Uh, I know we may be running out of time soon. Uh, and then we can pick questions at that point. Um, so what else can we do in these meetings and how do we make it more creative for people? Um, so the first one is um, there is something called the core protocols. Um, so um, and later on, I'll, we'll, I'll send the link in the, in the write-up where these core protocols can be found. Uh, but a core protocols is... Um, so there is a protocol called the check-in protocol, check-in, you know, and there is a protocol called the check-out protocol. So for some meetings, especially these days, uh, you may start, like, because we are coming from so many things, right? People may have had something in the morning, or maybe there is some emergency at home. Uh, so we don't really know what is the emotional state of this person. 
when they show up in a meeting so often times when you start a meeting you you may start by saying hey guys welcome to this meeting uh, let's do check in today uh, because you know and then you, you check in some sounds something like this right um this morning uh, i had i know i had this presentation today uh, so i've been preparing a lot i got up a bit early but i'm here fully present and i check in so check everybody will go around the room we get quick check in all they are telling you is their state of mind so once you know the state of mind you as a facilitator know oh this person has had a rough day let me make sure that i take care of them uh, otherwise and so that's kind of a check in protocol and then similarly there are many like the, i think there's 12 such protocols but you can as you master more and more of those you can bring any of them as you do your sessions and in in between those sessions and a check out protocol is a way to say hey i'm going to check out uh, because i have to go do something else you know in the day um, so so that's check in and check out protocols and then the other thing you can do is in in scrum teams there is a, a, a in scrum there are four events and one of the event is called as a retrospective a retrospective is a short feedback loop uh, it happens at the end of every sprint in scrum but with retrospectives one of the common complaints that comes is it gets really boring guys every week every two weeks we are meeting as the same thing we are using and over time we lose the funness of the retrospective so what one of the things that good uh, facilitators do is they bring back fun in every retrospective and you know you are a good facilitator when people show up to a retrospective expecting some magic to happen so for example um you could be using this kind of a, a, a digital board um so this is a, a style of retrospective called as a sail board um it's um it's something that you can use um and you set up this wall people will come and talk about it you talk about what is the goal of this sprint you know what made us feel good what helped us forward but what you're looking for is what held us back you know and people will put a bunch of sticky notes on what held us back so that we could not uh, we could not make progress so i use this a lot um in various sessions uh, whether it is agile or not but this is something people can relate to they can put sticky notes um, so one of the ways good thing about putting sticky notes first before talking is that it helps both the um you know the uh, the person who's a uh, kind of a um, uh you know the one who talks a lot and the one who is silent you know uh, they both can participate and put the sticky notes and then you can talk otherwise the one who is uh, kind of the the talking person um will take it over and then other people will not be able to contribute so when you do these kind of sessions make sure you put put ideas on the wall and then talk so a sailboat is a quick quick way quite a design on a on a, a, a wide wide board a, a digital wide board and then bring people to do a retrospective and you could do many other ones like you can actually go on a walk um there's so many other ways to do fun retrospectives in fact there's a site called fun retrospectives which you should probably look it up okay so the sometimes you may want to do something called as a lean coffee my goal is to give you a couple of different ideas uh, so lean coffee is a really quick way for in 20 minutes we want to get get a team together and have them talk about whatever they want to talk about that day right so you may have a general theme and a lean ca- coffee has an agenda so you look up lean coffee and you know the details of that so people will then say well let's put all the topics we want to talk about in this next 20 minutes and then once you do that everybody dot votes these topics and you pick the top 3 topics or top 4 topics and then you're going to go one by one you know you're going to talk it then you come and share so you, you won't be able to get through all the topics you're going to time box a lean coffee session for around 7 minutes at the end of the 7 minutes one topic gets done and then you ask hey do we need to pull another topic or not so so it's kind of one by one you go but what it does is if you want to continue everybody's got to do a thumbs up but even if one person does a thumbs on the side this topic is done and sometimes it's very frustrating like i would have put my favorite topic here nobody voted for the topic and it makes me really sad but i have no choice because the team has decided to talk about something else more important for them on that day so lean coffee you can do this once in a while you know in agile or other meetings as a quick way to do like a, a topics that the team cares about people care about and everything is time box is 7 minutes so look it up it's a probably a fun thing for you to learn and how to facilitate a lean coffee right next one is this um in amazon they don't use powerpoint right so there's something called the amazon narrative format sorry there's some text issues there i was trying to finish something um so and and narrative so when you go into these meetings um in amazon you'll see the first few minutes in many of their meetings are really silent in fact the first 15 minutes they're really silent and you're like what is going on versus in typical meeting you're going to start by you're going to start by talking introductions and all of that 
In Amazon, whoever is the host, they have to come back with a, a one, two, or a six page narrative. And there's a format to that. So this already writes like, what is that solution they're proposing? Uh, what research have they done? There's an end, there's an FAQ section. So people get the first 15 minutes to read everything. Once they're all in the same space, then the facilitator says, welcome to the meeting. Now that you have read what we are supposed to do in the meeting, let's talk about the options. I love this format. I run it in many of my sessions because people don't come prepared and oftentimes people are talking without listening. So um, by giving them something to read for 15 minutes, which the host has prepared really well, like a reading packet, this makes everybody in the same space. Now I can contribute, I know how to do. So, so try the, uh, uh, the narrative format uh, when you can. One or two more and I'll stop. The next one is called work the work pattern, right? Um, so many times when you go to a meeting and people say, well, we went to this meeting and we created five more meetings from this meeting. And so you just have meeting after meeting after meeting and no work actually gets done. So this was taught to be my, one of my colleagues uh, a few years ago. And what work the work is you block two hours or one hour or two hours for your team. And then everybody comes in the room and says, here is the work we need to get done right now. So everybody puts a sticky note on the wall and then you sit together in those two hours and you actually help each other for those two hours and whatever is the most important thing the team has to get done. It's kind of fun because you're trying to learn somebody else's work um, and, 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 and it's actually actual work getting done. You're not just sitting and talking in a meeting format, you're just doing work. And so every day I, we do this two hour block where we reserve the time for the team to do work the work. So um, in scrum teams, we call them core hours. These are protected time reserved for the team to do their work, okay? Um, okay, so lastly, you know, what are some tools we need? You know, so typically we'll need a lot of different tools. I've just put some of the ones I've been using. This is probably, there's a lot more. So collaboration tools, something like Slack, Teams, Confluence is really good, you know, um, and then there's a tool called Mentimeter. If you're running quiz and stuff like that, uh, Mentimeter is a good tool. Um, video perspective, you can use again Teams, Zoom, like how we're using today, sorry. Uh, and now, nowadays you can also do it in um, like the virtual world, like the meta world. So sometimes we do meetings using our um, Oculus headsets, uh, look up Alt Space VR, Alt VR, that's kind of a space for you to go do meetings, uh, have avatars, go online. It's so much fun to do once in a while team meetings using all space, including we do customer meetings on all space, which is so much fun. Then this is a must have for virtual, uh, for virtual events. You do need some kind of a whiteboard and the ones I use are like, there's many more, but uh, the ones I like are Miro, Mural and Lucid Spark. Um, and you can use whatever is your favorite tool, but you need to have this kind of a tool in order to do some of these facilitation. Otherwise you, you'll rather use Google Docs, which is fine too, or Microsoft Word, any of these tools will work, but some white space like this is really powerful to use. And lastly, you need some project management tools like Jira, Azure DevOps, as many of them, you know, in that space. So these are kind of the common tools that I use for facilitation. So again, my goal today was to introduce you the framework, um, talk about the before, during, after, give you some access to some of the techniques, uh, talk about the different personas who are there, how to manage them, talk about the uh, person who's like the facilitator and the observer and the participant and give you some tools and techniques. So that's kind of where I want to end, uh, start today and pick up any questions that you may have. So I want to pause and uh, look for any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Babu, for such a wonderful presentation today. We have been collecting some questions in the Q&A portion, so I'm just going to start throwing them at you, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the last few minutes of this webinar. So with so much working from home and remote meetings, how is it, like, how effective is it without video or with, like, you know, the nonverbal communication things that often happen in in-person meetings? How can we, you know, get those things in our meetings that are virtual and to make them more effective and interactive? Um, they feel like talking to a laptop screen with no direct eye contact is, does that impact the understanding within meetings? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So, um, yes, right. So I'm a, like, first of all, I'm a visual person. So for me, if I don't see the person, I don't know what to say, you know? So when they suddenly put off the video off, I don't know what to do. But at the same time, studies have shown post-COVID 
that hum- uh, we have never looked at ourselves for 8 hours in a day before in our life imagine sitting in front of a mirror looking at yourself for 8 hours in a day and so there is a study that's been going on that people are actually getting more depressed now sitting at 8 uh, hours looking at their own image so there are number of reasons where we may be putting video off right but at the same time i encourage teams to as much as possible at least once or twice a day put whatever format of video on so in my case i always put video on and whether the other person puts video on or not people know that the boost calls always a video on so sometimes i and i and we kind of get you know um used to that you know but i think without the video you'll really not know what the other person is doing but maybe there's something going on in their home right maybe there's someone sick maybe there's some uh, cleaner behind them so i think it's just being aware of what's happening around them but asking them sometimes also helps and then finding out why they're not doing it really helps as well so um, that's all i would say for that one so so then another question asked can the host and the facilitator be the same person this is something they often encounter where they have to host and facilitate at the same time i would say uh, for a, like a two people meeting for example that i spoke about yeah usually the same person but for large like if you really want to get an outcome done in a meeting i always like as a lead like sometimes i in my role i have like i ask for meetings but then i generally ask for like a facilitator because that removes me from talking people get confused are you talking as a host or a stake are you talking as a facilitator i'm confused you know so mm-hmm. i would encourage if possible to f- keep them separate but for small meetings sure i mean you can get away with that you know so but for larger events where you need something done i would highly encourage you to separate in scrum that's why there's a role it's called the scrum master you know so the role of a scrum master is to be the facilitator not the host you know and and so that's why it's important to have that scrum master role kind of solves that problem for you So we also had a few people ask, you know, we've all done it. We've all been in meetings where we've squirreled away. We've gotten distracted from the main topics, the main tasks, the outcomes. How would you recommend being able to bring meetings back on track to really focus on the intended outcome and the intended discussion? How do you stop on track? It means how do you bring it back is what you're saying? No. Mm-hmm. How do you bring a meeting back on back to the topic at hand? when it gets so, uh, so i discussed it. i discussed this concept of a parking lot you know so the parking lot is something that you can actually um put show the yellow card you know uh, like or a drink whatever is yellow next to you you know and then and then people will say oh yellow card i got a yellow card okay i know what i'm supposed to do right that's uh, if you teach them what you don't want to do is like um what you don't want to do it is like um do it without telling them right suddenly you don't want to show somebody a yellow card they get angry but i think if you teach them before they're quite okay with that you know the other thing is um is just um you know asking the people bringing you know bringing back the topic and saying hey guys let's show let's go back to a problem statement let's go back to outcomes are we actually following the outcome so the other thing to do is to kind of point out back to the outcome so people say oh we're not following our outcome but it's unfair as a facilitator if you don't do it you didn't do justice to the people you just let them do something happen and i feel it's like oh my god what are you doing you should have done that right so i feel that's important uh, to do that so um you actually answered quite a few with that one answer so thank you for that um how do you d- encourage dissenting opinions to foster more diverse input and healthy discussion oftentimes group thinks limits our progress and potential yeah so group things limit are 100% agree with that also you know sometimes there are studies that you know that's why the idea of let's talk after we put the ideas out right so so we think about the in, in the you know the sticky note idea in agile uh, if you have people put all the ideas up front you know then you are getting people starts out on the wall then you talk about it right so versus um otherwise you start by saying who has an idea of course if the, the person who is the strongest in the team always has an idea and once they speak others don't speak for whatever reason right so we want to avoid such behaviors um where we people feel um empowered to kind of put their idea out you know and um so it's really important for leaders to be silent you know and it's very tempting to keep talking you know but i would encourage the facilitator to have the conversation with the leader of the group and say you know is it okay for you to be quiet you know and sometimes they're like oh, of course i'll be quiet you know what do you think i'll be quiet right but you want to have the conversation before and not after so before the event starts find out who's the leader in the group and have a conversation with them that you know these are the kind of things i'll be doing and they're quite okay with that 
Cool. Um, so someone brought up an example. They're a scrum master for an 11 member DevOps team, um, which, you know, can be a challenge when you have such a large group. So you had mentioned, you know, you can break into smaller groups, but sometimes the takeaways are lost with like when you go back to the larger team. Any other suggestions for being a better facilitator for a large team or a large meeting? Yeah, so so you're saying your breakout rooms may not work because when you come back, everybody has to be connected back in the same topic. Mm -hmm. I don't have any immediate idea I can think of. You know, um, I think visual facilitation helps a lot. You know, so think of like if you're talking a lot as a facilitator. This today I'm not kind of I'm in the kind of talk mode. Therefore, you know, but generally when I facilitate you should not be talking at all, right? You're doing activities and setting up the boards and getting people together. So by creating a visual board, even though they're working in two teams, maybe they're putting all the information in one view, you know? So by putting in one view, everybody is seeing what's being put and then they come back and they update, right? And they come back and say, uh, uh, here is my update. You know, one of them gives an update. So that way, you know, they keep the view the same. So the two teams could see the same view and then have them come and give an update. That's what I would say. What I wouldn't encourage is 11 people talking in a call, right? Because now you have no idea uh, how can 11 people talk in a call? It's impossible, you know? It's like three of them will talk, other eight will remain silent. So it's really important to make sure everybody's voice is heard. You know? So um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, looking at what we have. Um, so especially when you have a recurring meeting with the same group of people, do you need to set up the kind of the agreements and the outcomes for each individual meeting? Or is that something that should be applicable for the entire series? How do you set up those agreements when it comes to recurring meetings? Great question. So I, yeah, obviously you don't want to spend every, every, every recurring meeting going through the agreement, but I generally keep it on the board. I will point to them like a list already prepared. So people know if the same group of people coming, they know what it is going to be, but you certainly want to, you don't want to go through the whole list each meeting, but you want to have it on a board or wall somewhere and remind people of the working agreement every now and then, right? Hey, and, and people get used to it. Uh, and then it's, it's part of your, it's called the team working agreement. So, which is about how the team wants to work together, right? So that is always on their mind, but I wouldn't necessarily do it for every recurring meeting, but at least keep it there. We pointed to it and that's good enough. You know, so. Awesome. All right. So I think we're going to wrap this up now. Thank you so much for your time, Vibhu, and all of your knowledge. We really appreciate you sharing it with us. Just a reminder to everybody um, in attendance today, we will be getting this recording posted in our resource library, as well as um, the slide deck and some extended notes that Vibhu has very generously um, pulled together for us. So you can expect an email from us in the next kind of week or so with a follow-up that'll give you a link to that resource library post, as well as a link to claim the SEU for attending this webinar. So we'll get all of that to y'all. Um, please, if you could, we would really appreciate it if you filled out the survey in that email as well to let us know how this webinar was and how we can continue improving this webinar series for you moving forward. Um, so yeah, thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time and we will see you at our next Approaching Agility webinar. Thanks guys. Yes, bye.